Hi everyone, this time we're going to talk about the force of friction. Friction is defined as the force that opposes motion. Um, combined from a whole bunch of different things, air resistance, uh, surface friction, and we'll talk about each of those in turn, but you must know this. Friction is the force that opposes motion. It's always going to be in the opposite direction. So if I push on a book to the right, friction force is going to act to the left. If my car is going forward, friction force is going to push in the opposite direction. If Superman is flying up, then the force of air friction on Superman is going to be down. If a child is swimming forward, then the friction force in the water is going to be backwards. So it, that's kind of simple. It's always in the opposite direction. This video, we're going to talk about surface friction. And surface friction is when two objects are, are moving relative to each other, when like when you're sliding a book across the table. And the surface friction is caused by microscopic roughness of texture. Um, I found a couple electron microscope pictures to kind of give you an idea. You might have a very, very smooth, well-sanded piece of wood, but on a microscopic scale, it's full of lots and lots of humpity bumps. Um, the stainless steel, very smooth sur uh, surface. It is used in medicine. It is used in cooking industry. Lots of places where you want things to be very smooth and clean. And on a microscopic scale, it is even covered with humpity bumps. Friction turns energy into heat. So it turns motion or energy into heat. Here's a picture of car brakes that are actually glowing because as this car is braking, there's so much heat produced that it's actually getting hot, so hot that it glows. Uh, you may have done this. I've never done it, and I, I don't know if I'd be successful at it, but if you've ever tried to start a fire by rubbing two sticks together, um, in this picture, this person is getting a little bit of smoke, and it is due to all of that heat that is produced by the friction of rubbing these two objects together. So we're going to talk about surface friction, one object moving relative to another object. Now, a couple weird and crazy things about surface friction. First is if an object has no sideways force on it, it's just sitting still, your coffee cup is sitting on the table in front of you, there is no frictional force acting on it. There are humpity bumps in the bottom of one object, there are humpity bumps in the bottom of the other object, and it's kind of like nooks and crannies in, a, in two combs, like you have two combs of the little nooks and crannies are kind of all wedged in next to each other but there is no friction force until you start getting a lateral or a sideways force. So if you've got an object on your desk, take that object and push on it just a little bit, not so much that it moves, but just so that you feel a tiny bit of resistance. What happens is on the microscopic scale, the object has these humpity bumps, like tooths on a comb. On the table, there are humpity bumps. And as soon as you provide a lateral or sideways force, these things start bumping into each other. Um, I always like to do this by la lacing my fingers together, fingers with one hand and fingers with the other hand. And if they're just one nook and cranny just meets, there's no friction. But when they start pushing one against the other, those sideways f forces, that provides friction. Now, it is possible to have friction but no motion. A force is applied that is not big enough to actually move the object, but big enough to start making these microscopic things rub against each other. Now, if you increase the amount of force that you're pushing on your coffee cup or whatever, you can actually accelerate it. If the force applied is bigger than the force of friction, yes, you're going to have lots of these little microscopic doodles pushing on each other, but then you can actually achieve an acceleration if the applied force is larger than the frictional force. There are two types of surface friction. One of them is called static friction, and the other one is called kinetic friction. And I like the words because you can, just looking at the words, you know which one is which. Static is a situation where you've got friction between two objects that are not yet 
moving. Now, if you think of something that is static, static means not moving. Um, it means no motion. If you have a stagnant pond or pool, it is one where water is not moving. Kinetic, as in kinematics, kinetic or cinema means motion. So this is the kind of friction between two objects that are already moving. Kinetic friction can also be called sliding friction, but I prefer to use kinetic because there's way too many S's the other way and I get confused. The symbol we use to describe the friction, the friction on a surface is this. It's a Greek letter mu, and that Greek letter mu will often have a subscript S for static or K for kinetic. Let me ask you a question. Which do you suspect is a larger quantity of friction, static friction or kinetic friction? Now think about this. Think about you've got a couch or a piece of furniture that you're trying to move across your house. What is more difficult, to start the object moving or to keep it moving once it's already in motion? Yeah, starting out is almost always more force. So typically, Static friction is going to be bigger than kinetic friction. And if you think about these interlacing little humpity bumps, um, static friction, you've got all these little microscopic bits and pieces. All the nooks and crannies are intertwined with each other. And when you start something moving, they are then going to rub against each other, and that's going to be a big quantity of friction. Once you have an object in motion, well, the humpity bumps of one object are riding on top of the humpity bumps of another object, and there's a lot less friction here than after the nooks and crannies have already kind of seated themselves in place. Here's a beautiful example of static and kinetic friction, and it's ABS brakes. ABS brakes stands for Automatic Braking System. Now, if you are a broke college student and you have, do not have APS brakes, what do they tell you to do if you want to stop quickly? Yeah, they always say pump your brakes. And why in the world would they have you pump your brakes? And the, this picture kind of illustrates somebody going blah, 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 If you have ABS brakes, what does the ABS brakes do for you? Well, it does the same thing. It pumps the brakes, but it pumps them much more quickly than your sweet little human foot is going to be able to do. So what's the deal about pump and brakes? Why in the world does that give you a bigger amount of friction and a shorter stopping distance than without brake assist, without ABS brakes, you are going to have a bigger stopping distance and you are a more in likely to get into some sort of a crash. So how does this work? Well, it works because of static and kinetic friction, and I'll explain that in a minute, but I found this picture and it was too darn cute to not include. So ABS breaks on, ABS breaks off. Why does this relate to what we're talking about? Here's why. If you pump your brakes, what you do is you keep your brakes in a state of static friction. What that means is you keep your tires rotating. Why do you want your tires to rotate? Because on a microscopic level, your tires are full of lots of microscopic humpity bumps, and the road is full of microscopic humpity bumps. If you keep your tires rotating, the bumps fall into the bumps of the road, and you stay in a state of static friction, as long as the tires keep rotating. Rotating. Now, if you lock up your brakes and slide, sliding is kinetic friction. And kinetic friction is a situation where your road has humpity bumps in it and your tire has humpity bumps in it, but you are sliding one little hump over the tops of the other little humps, and this is a much smaller quantity of friction, and it is going to give you a bigger stopping distance. And we want to avoid accidents. That's why brake assists are such a wonderful, wonderful thing. There is an equation that goes with frictional forces. And here's another big important equation. So write that down and uh, put it on your formula sheet. Friction force, F sub little f, is mu, the coefficient of friction, times 
normal force. Now, normal force, if you recall, is the force perpendicular to a surface, and it is typically the supporting force of that surface. Um, mu is the ratio of friction force divided by normal force. Both of these are measured in newtons, and when you have a ratio, newtons divided by newtons equals 1, and it basically gives you a unitless number because of the fact that it is a ratio. So coefficient of friction has no units. But coefficient of friction is how we quantify stuff that is slippery and stuff that has a lot of friction. Every textbook has got somewhere in it, every physics book anyhow, some sort of a coefficient of friction table. So let's take a look at this table. First off, notice that it contains two columns, ms, excuse me, mu s and mu k. What's s and k stand for? Static friction and kinetic friction. If you glance down these, you'll notice that throughout, static friction tends to be bigger than kinetic friction. There are a few places where it's the same. Um, Teflon is just plain slippery, so it's the same in both conditions. Teflon on steel, still really, really slippery. But most of the time, static is going to be larger than kinetic. This is, again, a partial table. It's not a complete table. But it also always has two materials listed, steel on steel, aluminum on steel, copper on steel, uh, glass on glass, Teflon on Teflon, rubber on concrete, dry and wet. Why is this interesting? Well, that's car tires, dry and wet car tires. So. If you have to do a problem involving the coefficient of friction, make sure you look up the coefficient of friction needed. This is a very partial table. Um, there are huge, massive lists of things. And if you worked for a company that dealt with a lot of friction, if you were an engineer someplace, you would create your own experiments to make sure you had the exact details. Now I'm going to spend a few more minutes looking at this table because I want you to look at it and understand what coefficient of friction, now this is just the mu, not the friction forces, but just the mu, what it depends upon. First off, it depends on if you have static or kinetic. Static, just starting to move or already in motion. The other thing that coefficient of friction depends upon is the nature of the two substances. Remember I said there's always going to be two substances listed when you talk about coefficient of friction. But what's even more interesting is what the coefficient of friction is independent of. One is speed. There is not a separate coefficient of friction if you're going 20 miles an hour and a different one if you're going 50 miles per hour. You can use the same coefficient of friction for both situations as long as you're going slow enough to keep the two surfaces touching. If you are moving with such crazy fast speed that you start to get some lift and the surface is now no longer in touch with the bottom surface, well, then that's a more complicated and different situation. Coefficient of friction is also independent of surface area. Um, if you have a bicycle tire, bicycle tires are going to have pretty much the same coefficients of friction as a car because it's going to be rubber on concrete. And it doesn't say, hey, you got skinny tires, so you're going to use a different coefficient of friction. Use the same coefficient of friction. Does not depend upon surface area touching the ground. Another example of that is you'd use the same coefficient of friction if you're talking about a small car or an 18-wheel truck. Coefficient of friction is also independent of weight. Now, I'm not saying friction forces. Friction force does depend on weight. But we're talking just about coefficient of friction, and there is not a different coefficient of friction for trucks or cars or bicycles. All right, that will do it, and we're going to come back next time with some example problems dealing with friction.